Partisan polarization remains a deep-seated element of American politics, but a new Pew Research poll finds that it isn't just the divide between parties that separates Americans, but also the divides within parties. CBS News Chief Political Analyst John Dickerson joins me now with more. Hi there, John. Um, good to talk to you. So this is really interesting because we are looking at the show Red and Blue, uh, understanding there's, of course, way more nuance in the electorate, right? So what did you find most telling in this poll? It's good, good to be with you, Elaine. That's right. It's, it's not just red and blue. There's some light blue and some magenta. And mm -hmm. basically, Pew did this survey of about 10,000 people, so much, much bigger than your normal surveys. And they found about nine, not about, they found nine distinct political types. Now, they arranged to left and right that we're familiar with. But what's so important about this study is that it takes us behind the kind of shorthand we always have to use in having conversations to show us the gradations within individual parties. So, for example, on the right, you have parts of the Trump coalition, the Republican coalition, that are very much in favor of uh, closing the borders. They're very much against immigration in two different parts of that Republican right. But on the populist right, which is very much against any kind of integration, really, they have a very, very negative view of corporations. Only 17 percent of that group thinks that corporations make a fair profit. Well, there are other portions of the Republican group that are uh, much, much more favorable to, to corporations, see them as the embodiment of the American dream. So you see real differences in the Republican side. On the Democratic side, there aren't so much differences like that. But what you see is differences in intensity. So, for example, they might both believe that um, policies need to be put in place to help women in the workplace, but they have different views about how intense those policies should be, how much change there should be. Should they rip up the system altogether or fix things within the, the American system? So, you know, my favorite group name, at least, is the stressed sideliners, uh, John. And I wonder um, if you could just tell us a bit about that, because in all seriousness, this is a representation of a group um, that is dealing with some struggles and that doesn't necessarily neatly fit in to any one category. Can you talk about that a little bit? Right. So the stressed sideliners are the people who look at the political process and they don't have very strong feelings about it and they don't see that it represents them. They have a variety of different views that you might think of as Republican and Democrat, but they basically look at the process and they don't really want to engage. Some of them don't engage or they they uh, and and what happens when you look at the nine different groups, if you look at the most ideologically fervent in both parties. So in the Republican Party, that group is called the faith and flag conservatives. They are the most Republican, the most Donald Trump, the sort of MAGA crowd. And then on the left, you have the progressive left. Well, the stressed uh, sideliners find both the left and the right just too hot for them. But they don't participate, the stressed sideliners. The ones who participate in the primaries and in Twitter and social media and all the conversations are the, 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 the faith and flag conservatives on the right and the progressives on the left. But while I'm in this neighborhood, one of the things you see in this, in this uh, look at the nine different groups is that on the left, the most liberal, the most far to the left, only represent 12 percent of the Democratic Party. On the right, the faith and flag conservatives represent 23 percent of the Republican Party. So you see the way in which the most fervent of the Republican Party represent a larger share of that party, which, which when you look at the way in which uh, the, the tail wags the dog in these parties, it has a lot more power in the Republican Party. There are just more of them. Yeah, on that point, John, what context does this um, poll and do these categories give on some of the political fights that we're seeing right now? Well, exactly. And that's what's so interesting about this. So let's take one, the most, uh, the hottest issue and the most sensitive issue in America, according to the poll, and just if you've been paying attention to politics, and that's race. If you look at the way Republicans look at it, 75% of Republicans say basically not much has to be done, if anything. Basically, don't do anything more in society to ameliorate the inequalities as a result of race. That's 75% of the groups on the right. On the left, it's the exact opposite number. 75% of the groups on the left that are affiliated with the Democratic Party, 75% of those groups believe that a lot or a fair amount needs to be done to rebalance opportunity in America or provide opportunity for the first, in the first place for black Americans. 
So this isn't just a debate about do you do a little here, do you do a little there. This is a fundamental difference in the way the two parties see the world. One sees a problem that needs fixing. One doesn't see a problem that needs any fixing at all. That is, that's most acute on the issue of race. It's also true, of course, with climate change and with immigration. If the parties can't even agree that issues are worth addressing, they never get to the stage where they have a debate about how those issues should be addressed. And then briefly, you asked about modern issues. If you look in the Democratic Party, there's a big debate about how big the president's social agenda should be. Inside these poll numbers, you see that the progressive left in the, progress in the Democratic Party wants a lot of government action. Other groups, which are much bigger, the establishment left, um, they don't necessarily want, they want government intervention. Everybody's agreed on that, but they don't want it as, in as big a way as the progressive left wants. And we see that playing out every day in the halls of Congress, those differences within the Democratic Party. Yeah, we've covered that a lot here on Red and Blue. So, John, on what areas do Democrats and Republicans seem to agree? Two areas. One is on the role of corporations and taxing the wealthy. Uh, you have the populist right, which is tied with those faith and family conservatives for the largest share of the Republican vote. That populist right, uh, very big supporters of Donald Trump, have no faith in corporations. They're happy to tax the wealthy, and they think the wealthy should be taxed. Well, that is obviously, there's a lot of overlap with various Democratic groups. The problem, of course, is that there's not only just one issue of taxation to be debated between these groups. Uh, and so those populist right, uh, the people in the populist right category have affiliations with the Republican Party that are stronger. So you won't see them go running over to the Democratic Party, but they do share an overlap in issues there. Then another interesting overlap is we talk a lot about independence. Well, there are three groups. You talked, oh, we've already talked about the stress sideliners. There's also a group called the ambivalent right and the outsider left. These are people with weak ties to their parties, disappointed with the political system, and they have some, uh, but they are a little bit involved in politics. Okay, all three of those would like to see an independent party. The problem is each one of those groups has a totally different set of issues that they care about, and they often are in conflict. So they may want an independent party, but if you brought them all into a room, they would very have a very difficult time agreeing with each other. So. They're not activists, and they don't agree, except on the fact that they don't like what they've got so far. So it shows you that while people talk about a third party, there's no uh, constituency within these ideological groups on which you could build a third party. Well, John, on the question of polling, in the wake of a number of elections in recent years, there's been a lot of attention on polling and the challenges specifically that pollsters face as technology and attitudes about polling have changed. So with that in mind, how, would, how is it you think we should be understanding or thinking about polling to try and understand these various components of the electorate? Well, you always bring along your tumbler of Morton's salt to add salt to any polling that you get, particularly horse race polling. Um, and, and there are some wonderful um, assessments and analysis of horse race polling and the quality of individual uh, pollsters. And so um, we saw that Virginia was pretty close in the predictions that were made, not so close in, in, in or not as good in New Jersey. That was in part because there weren't as many polls. Now, those are horse race polls, and so those we've learned to be wary of and to only trust pollsters who do it well, and even those who do it well can make mistakes. This kind of polling on issues, first of all, it's an enormous number of people who were surveyed over the course of 10 days in July. So that makes it a more durable poll. Um, and then what you do is once you have those findings, if you feel like they're durable, then you see if they match up with reality. And what I find so interesting about these numbers is they tend, it tends to match up with the reality we see. Another reality, of course, is within the Democratic Party, there's a debate about how to respond to the elections of last week. And you have some people saying that the party is too, too uh, progressive, too far to the left. You have others saying we need to be more moderate in the middle. It's an argument not about what the party should be doing, but the way in which they should be doing it. And that shows up in these, in these poll numbers in terms of these different gradations of the party. Agreement on things like race and that something needs to be done, just disagreement about whether the system needs to be completely rewired or whether uh, solutions can be found within the system. So you take the poll findings and see if it matches up with the reality of, in the interviews you do and what, how voters behave, and that gives you a sense of whether the polling you're reading um, is any good or not. All right, speaking of getting things right and wrong, let's flash back to this moment. Let's watch. 
Republican lawmakers who, they have a duty right now. Now, let a little time pass to accommodate the freshness of the news, accommodate the president's idiosyncrasies. But at some point, if the president continues to, to claim fraud and that this is a stolen election, he will be burning Democratic furniture. And there will be members of his party who will know better. And the danger politically for them is that in this moment, when they know better, it becomes the verdict on their careers. They knew better and they did nothing. All right, John Dickerson, November of 2020. What do you think you got right or wrong since that day? So that was a year ago today. Um, well, <laughs> I don't usually make predictions, and maybe that's why. I think what I got right was burning Democratic furniture was you know, a flourish in the moment, but it turned out to be real. We saw the burning of them I and the destruction of Democratic furniture. The symbols of democracy were attacked, burned, and broken on January 6th. So that turned out to be the case, and it was, you could see it there on the 9th of, of November, that if a president came out and with no evidence made a claim that was that incendiary and with knowing the relationship he had with his voters, it was obvious to see that that was the outcome. You don't have to be that smart, which is why somebody like me could make that claim. <laughs> Where I got it wrong is... Uh, well, I'll try and split the wrongness in two. One, I think, you know, history takes a long time to make its verdicts. And I think those members of, the, of President Trump's party who knew better, who could see, as I did, that this was going to, um, you cannot make a claim like that with no evidence and, and think it's just going to go away. Um, they knew better and they did nothing. And at the end of history, that may be a verdict on their careers. But in the short term, politically, um, it is now almost the price of admission in Republican politics to play footsie with the idea, the lie and the incorrect idea that the election was stolen. That's a long way from where it was after the insurrection, but it has changed. There is, um, there is a, uh, an effort to move away from what happened as a result of the president's position. And politically, there is more damage to be had in the Republican Party if you admit that what the president said was a lie and you admit that it led to an insurrection and you talk about it openly. That is what hurts you politically. Uh, and that's the opposite of what uh, I was claiming, although I was, as I say, also talking about the verdict of history, which takes a few more years to pass before those verdicts come in. Well, John, I remember you saying uh, once norms have been violated or thresholds have been crossed, um, it's very difficult to go back. And that certainly feels as if that's the moment that we're in now. John Dickerson, great to have you with us. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Elaine.